Good evening. Over the last couple of months, I've taken several opportunities to speak directly to the circumstances that we've been dealing with as the New South Wales government has instituted measures to slow and suppress the spread of the coronavirus. Now, I've brought uh, four messages in a little series I've called The Pandemic Experience. Uh, this is number five and it's not going to be very long. For our church family, uh, the pandemic experience hasn't been uniform. In other words, uh, it hasn't been the same for everyone. Uh, for some, aside from not being able to attend church and various social activities, uh, life hasn't changed very much at all. Uh, maybe there's been less contact with friends and family members. Uh, maybe there's been more <laughs> via the telephone. But in reality, day-to-day -day life has not been so very different. For others, the, the coronavirus restrictions have caused significant change. Uh, there has been substantial disruption to daily routines and it's been a very difficult time. Uh, some have had to deal with major challenges at work, I think especially of the teachers and those who work in health and aged care. Uh, others have lost uh, income or lost employment altogether. Uh, for those that have children at school or who homeschool, uh, it has also been a difficult time. Uh, online learning at home uh, wasn't much fun for many parents and I'm among that group. And for those who homeschool, uh, all of the, the reg regu regular activities outside of the home were cancelled. Uh, no meetups in the park, no visits to the library, and so on. Now for some, the mental and emotional challenges have been acute. Uh, there has been a real struggle with isolation or with anxiety. Uh, I've, I've battled with this side of things and uh, I'm thankful that the Lord has given me peace about a number of issues that were troubling me. Uh, some people have struggled this way, uh, they've been quite anxious or discouraged and others haven't. Uh, as I said, uh, for our church family, uh, the pandemic experience hasn't been the same for everyone. Now, as of last Friday, the 15th of May, the restrictions in New South Wales have eased a little and I suspect some will take advantage of that and go to the park with the children or go out for a meal or have some people over for a cuppa. And uh, others will continue to uh, self-isolate and limit their in-person contact. Now we're all different. Uh, we have different health needs and concerns. Uh, we have different ideas about what's in our best interests and in the best interests of our families and that's okay. Uh, we shouldn't judge those who are taking advantage of the easing of the restrictions and getting out and about and we shouldn't criticize those who are still choosing to stay at home and keep to themselves. One thing we've all had to come to terms with is not being able to meet as the church for worship and fellowship on the Lord's Day. Now on top of this, for the children, uh, they haven't been able to go to Sunday school or to Blast, our kids club, and our beloved Diamonds, our over 50s group, uh, hasn't been able to meet either. I wonder how you're feeling about this, about not being able to go to church. Our last church service was held on Sunday the 22nd of March. Uh, for those who were there, it was an unusual experience as we endeavoured to keep the rules about social distancing. Uh, before that particular Sunday, a number of people had already decided to self-isolate. And so that means for some, it's been nine weeks since they've been to church. Uh, for the rest of us, it's been eight weeks to put that in perspective, that's nearly two months, uh, almost the equivalent of an entire school term. Perhaps for some of you, this is the longest period of time in your life uh, where you haven't been to church, or the longest period since you've been a Christian. 
I'm not sure when we'll be able to meet again. Uh, as it stands, uh, 10 worshippers are permitted at a religious gathering. Uh, but for our church, this is complicated by the fact that we don't have our own building and we're still not permitted to use the premises where we have been meeting. And furthermore, only five people are allowed to visit a private home. So uh, we're not really in a position to have any kind of formal church gathering as yet, at least not indoors. I heard a preacher recently use the term providentially hindered. He used that to describe the church's inability to meet for worship. No, it's not that we're being persecuted for our faith in Christ. Uh, it's not because we're rebelling against the biblical exhortation to gather. It's because we've been providentially hindered from doing so. God in his sovereignty has ordained these present circumstances, uh, circumstances that prevent us from assembling on the Lord's Day. And it's not the first time that Christians have had to deal with pandemics. Uh, they used to call them plagues. And you can find examples in church history where ministers and congregations had to deal with circumstances like the ones we're dealing with and, and had to wrestle with the issues that we're wrestling with. Only for them, it was much more difficult because they didn't have the scientific knowledge, the medical care, the economic support and the communications technology that we have. The challenge for many of us, I hope for all of us, has been accepting this reality. Accepting that we can't meet together on the Lord's Day. I, I hope it's been a hard thing for you to forego. I, I hope it's something you missed and still miss. If not being able to go to church has, has barely registered, if, if it's been a, a relatively minor thing to let go of, then you're probably not very spiritually healthy. Uh, it should concern you if you're not really missing church. Uh, the Christian life is a corporate life. It's, it's a life that's lived together with other Christians. It's, it's life in a body where each gives to the other and receives from the other. And yes, uh, every local body is imperfect. <laughs> every local assembly of believers could do better in terms of ministering to one another. And our church is no different. Uh, they say if you find a perfect church, don't go there because you'll ruin it. The point is that the Christian life is a life in community, a life in a family. That's one of the more obvious truths you see when you read the New Testament. And so assuming that it's been a challenge to accept these restrictions, uh, assuming it's been hard not to meet together, what we've had to do is learn to be content. We've had to learn to accept our present situation and be satisfied. And this is what the Apostle Paul talks about in Philippians chapter 4. Uh, these are very familiar verses, verses 10 through 12. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Now Paul, who was in prison in Rome when he penned this letter, uh, was rejoicing because he had received a gift from the Philippian church, probably a financial gift. Their, their care for Paul had flourished. They, they'd wanted to give him something in the past, but they hadn't been able to. And uh, Paul was very grateful for their generosity, very grateful to have received something from them now. Now, Paul mentions this gift in verse 14. He says, Notwithstanding, ye have well done, 
that ye did communicate with my affliction. Now the word communicate means to share or to contribute. The Philippians made a contribution to Paul. They, they shared their substance with Paul while he was suffering. And as I said, this was cause for rejoicing. Uh, Paul was praising God for this. However, he also makes the point here that he had learned contentment. It was a, a blessing to receive this gift, but he had learned to be content when there wasn't a gift, when he, when he wasn't receiving financial support. He had learned how to be content when he had a lot and when he had a little, when he was being brought low and when he was being lifted up. That was his experience as a missionary apostle. Uh, sometimes his circumstances were incredibly difficult. We see that in the book of Acts. And sometimes his circumstances were okay. Uh, the ministry went well. He was well received and he was well supported. Now, the Greek word translated content uh, literally means self-sufficient. In context here it carries the idea of having enough for oneself, being satisfied. I've learned that I have enough in whatever situation I'm in. I've learned to be satisfied. Now this wasn't because Paul believed he was self-sufficient in the sense that he, he had the power to meet all of his own needs. Uh, that he had it within himself to be satisfied in any set of circumstances. No, not at all. It was because he understood that he had Christ. Verse 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And Paul expressed it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. And the ability to be content, the power to experience satisfaction in all circumstances, came from the Lord Jesus Christ. It was the peace of Christ. It was the joy of Christ. It was the, the comfort of Christ in Paul's heart by the work of the Holy Spirit. This contentment was the assurance that God would provide for him and keep him safe for as long as he wanted him to carry out his ministry. And there were some very difficult days. But there was grace enough for those days. Paul had learned this firsthand. And so the highs didn't make him proud and cause him to forget the Lord. And the lows didn't break his spirit. He wasn't overcome by anxiety or frustration or discouragement. Now, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content, to be satisfied at rest within my soul. And the same can be true for us at this point in our Christian lives where we are providentially hindered from gathering for worship and fellowship. We can be content we can even grow and go forward in the Christian life. Now sure, we'd prefer to be able to go to church. Uh, we'd prefer to have our children at Sunday school and blast. Uh, we'd love to be able to meet up with our brothers and sisters in Christ and, and have that cup of tea before the Sunday service. We miss singing together and praying together and sitting under the sound of God's word as a family of believers. We, we miss all of that. We eagerly anticipate being able to go back to church, but we can experience contentment now, in the midst of these circumstances, because we have Christ. The one who strengthened Paul who enabled Paul to have peace and joy in every situation, can enable us to experience the same things in this situation, if we'll look to him and the means by which he gives us grace.
God has not left us with nothing. God has not left us to our own devices. We have his abiding presence in the person of the Holy Spirit. We have his word. We have the gift of prayer. We have Christian music to encourage us and lift us heavenward. We have ways to communicate with each other. Uh, we have the care of our church leaders if, if we need it. They're, they're just a phone call away. And we still have the regular teaching and preaching of God's word, even if it's via a television screen or an iPad. We have more than enough to be content despite the restrictions on our ability to gather. And I suspect many of us are. Maybe it's taken a while, but we have peace about where we find ourselves at the moment. Again, we'd prefer things were back to normal, but we've accepted that this is the way things are and the way they're going to be for a while. Uh, we've adjusted to not getting ready for church on Sunday morning and heading down to the hall. Uh, we've adjusted to not having that mad scramble to get the kids dressed and ready for Sunday school. We've learned to be content, and that's a blessing. But it would be remiss of me if I didn't talk about the danger that we face as this season continues. A danger that grows the longer this goes. And that is the danger of contentment transforming into complacency. Now perhaps this is more of a temptation for some than for others. Uh, maybe what I'm about to say is way outside of your present experience. And if so, praise the Lord. The truth is, that now there is no fixed time and place on the Lord's Day for corporate worship. The responsibility is on individuals and families to decide when to worship or if to worship. Uh, the responsibility is squarely on you to set aside a time to sing, pray and receive the preaching and teaching of God's Word. And if you decide not to do that, only you, your family and the Lord will know. Now, as we become accustomed to not going to church on Sunday, there is the temptation to become distracted by other things, other pursuits. There is the temptation not to be as disciplined, not to be as committed. The longer this goes for, the easier it will become on any given Sunday to arrive at the conclusion that well, it's just too hard to worship today. We've had a busy week and we're tired and, man, the kids have been a handful. Look, we'll do it later. We'll watch something on YouTube after the kids have gone to bed or whatever. And then it doesn't happen. And you don't end up receiving God's word. There is no worship on the Lord's day at all. And there is the temptation to have a shift in our priorities and decide to use Sundays to do other things. I mean, we can, we can go places and visit people and work around the house and do all kinds of things on Sundays. And this complacency about setting aside time for worship on the Lord's Day can flow over into our devotional lives and into our, our personal walk with the Lord. Without the regularity of Lord's Day worship, without the week-by-week -week ministry of the Word and the encouragement of our brothers and sisters in Christ, everything can slide. And perhaps we're not praying like we used to. We're not reading the Bible. We're not looking to bless others. We've become spiritually lazy and lethargic. And we're starting to see that the fruit of that in our own souls and in our homes. And if not, we will. It's the fruit of the Spirit or it's the works of the flesh. If we're not walking in the Spirit, then it will be the works of the flesh. And that's always to our detriment and the detriment of our loved ones. Now again, this might not be your experience at the moment at all. 
Perhaps your devotional life is as strong and enriching as it's ever been. Your commitment to the Lord Jesus has not waned one bit. Praise God for that. Praise God. But brothers and sisters, I can see complacency coming towards me. I can see it as a very real threat to my walk with the Lord. I can see how easy it would be for me to ease off in my commitment to God's word, in my commitment to prayer. I I can sense the, the temptation to be less concerned about fulfilling my responsibilities to our church family. And I'm probably not the only one who senses this. Let's be honest this evening. Do do, do you sense it? Do you see complacency as a very real threat to your walk with the Lord? In this same little epistle where Paul talks about contentment, he also talks about striving. Chapter 1, verse 27, he writes, Only let your conversation or your manner of life be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Notice, if you would, the last part. Uh, Paul's desire for the church at Philippi was that they would be united be standing fast in one spirit, and that together they would be striving for the faith of the gospel. Now the Greek word translated striving refers to an athletic endeavour or contest. Uh, Think of a, a sprinter exerting herself as she runs towards the finish line. Paul envisions the Philippian Christians living that way, exerting energy and doing so together, striving together, not against each other, but with each other, like like a team that's running together, that's working together. He's talking about a united effort. And, And all of that energy is being expended for the faith of the gospel. Now, this is a reference to the, to the Christian faith, to the, the body of beliefs that make up the gospel. Paul's desire for the Christians at Philippi was that they would be, be striving to understand the faith of the gospel, striving to live out the faith of the gospel, striving to proclaim the faith of the gospel. He pictures the Christian life as one of spiritual activity, not a life of indolence. You see, there are are two aspects that seem to contradict each other, but they don't. For the Christian, there is a holy contentment and there is a holy striving. We are people at rest, at rest in Christ, at rest in our Father's love, and we're people at work, working for our Lord, working to further his kingdom in our hearts, in our homes, and in our world. We're people who can experience true satisfaction in every circumstance, and we're people who are serving the Lord in every sphere. We have peace in our hearts, and yet we're pressing on. In fact, that's what Paul said in chapter 3 and verse 14. This was his personal testimony. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Matthew Henry, in his commentary on this verse, says... As he who runs a race never takes up short of the end, but is still moving forwards as fast as he can. So those who have heaven in their eye must still be pressing forward to it in holy desires and hopes and constant endeavours and preparations. The fitter we grow for heaven, the faster we must press towards it. 
I love that last sentence. The fitter we grow for heaven, the faster we must press towards it. Content or complacent? That's the question we need to ask ourselves during this season in which we are providentially hindered from gathering for worship. Are we staying the course? Are we making progress? Or are we slackening off? Are we going backwards? I know there are challenges. <laughs> I know the circumstances have not been easy and will not be in the weeks and months to come. I know we struggle with the world, the flesh and the devil. I know that sometimes the battle with our flesh alone is enough to wear us down and discourage us. But I am also convinced that God's grace is greater still and sufficient for these days. Don't let contentment transform into complacency. With God's help, let's continue to press on. Amen.